Everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and this is your weekly show about board games and the people who play them. Today we're going to be doing something different. Normally I start the segment by jawing with you all a bit, and then we jump into the news. But I'm going to, um, and then I do Tom Thinks later on in the show. But I'm going to do Tom Thinks first, and then do the news later on in the show. And I wanted to do this because I thought that this was important, so I want to talk to you all about it. A couple years ago... Some folks brought to my attention that I was kind of a Debbie Downer when I, in, in the game group. I would see some people playing a game, and I'd be like, that game isn't very good. Uh, and I would see them playing a game that I didn't enjoy and make a comment on how I thought the game was terrible. Now, I did it in a joking way, and they were my own opinions, but me saying I didn't like the game, even as a joke, wasn't something that really benefited the table at all. Hopefully, I've learned from that experience and try to be more positive in my gaming groups. Now, you know that on the Dice Tower, we call a spade a spade. And we try to be enthusiastic about opinions no matter what. If we see a game that we think is bad, we tell you that it's bad. If we see a game that's good, you know we're super enthusiastic about it being good. Either way, we're going to be enthusiastic. But just as my putting a game down in front of people enjoying it was not something that's not constructive at the least, so, so were my mannerisms in my Tom Think segment last week. Now, before we get started here, I want to make a couple things clear. First of all, no one is making me do this. I decide everything that gets put on Board Game Breakfast. No one has control over this show. My segment last week was mine and mine alone. My segment this week is mine and mine alone. And I stand by most of the statements that I made last week, but there's a problem. See, I want to, I want to use the Dice Tower to be a constructive force in the hobby. I want to grow the hobby in various ways, and I, I'm really thrilled to see how exciting it, it, it's just grown in the past years. And yet, my Tom Thinks segment last week really came off like a Tom Rants. With all negative and no positive, I use words to say, there are good local game stores out there, but my tones really said otherwise. And I did it off the cuff, which I shouldn't do on such a sensitive topic. I do tend to you know, do a lot of my things off the cuff. I know some of you are shocked, like, what, really? Um, but it came out jumbled and in a bad light. But worst of all, I didn't add anything positive to the conversation. And even though I, I can't say this sincerely enough, I did not mean it, it came out as a negative blast against all local game stores. And in doing this, I heard a lot of people in the local game industry. I've heard from a lot of people this week. And of course, I've gone back and watched my segment myself, and I'm not really happy with what I saw. Rather than leading a charge for good, positive change in the hobby, I just kind of ran it. Now, we ran a lot at the Dice Tower, and much of it's tongue-in-cheek, and this didn't feel like that, especially when viewed objectively. And I talked a lot about how I haven't had the best experience at many local game stores I've been to. I live in the Miami area, and there's some great stores up in Fort Lauderdale. The ones here aren't really too hot, although happily a new one's opening quite soon. I'm very excited about that. But there are great local stores out there. I've certainly received a lot of feedback on that regard, and uh, both from owners of the stores and people who go to these establishments, and that is fantastic. And I want the Dice Tower to be a place where we support these local game stores. You know, if I travel to a place where there's a local game store, I like to go visit it and check them out and promote them. So let me make part of what I'm saying this week a positive swing towards local game stores because there are good reasons to support great local game stores. First of all, as a community. Now, that seems kind of counter to what I said last week. Last time I praised the online game community, and, and when I do that, I'm thinking for good reason. You know, the Jack Fest Memorial Fund exists because of the online community. We exist right now because of the online gaming community. Board Game Geek and many others exists, and the community does a lot to bring people in the hobby. But, you know, there's no question that there's a dark side and a nasty side to the internet, too. As I always say, you know, anyone who says that they are their own worst critic has uh, never read the internet. 
I've dealt with this on occasion. But while some game stores have become clicks, and it's not just game stores that do that, community groups, gatherings, churches have the same problem, a game store can provide a safe haven, well, some people call it a third place, for people who don't feel welcome in many other places. One retailer uh, told me that when they opened their game store in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, they were just they were just flabbergasted to see how many people came and just gamed and gamed and had a great time. They were kind of in a way escaping the outside problems. And I've heard similar stories to this, even with this past week's tragedy and different things, where people go gaming to get away from other things. This is a fantastic thing. So many people don't have that place where everybody knows your name, except the game store. And so many people have formed lasting, long-time friendships because of the game store and have gotten involved in the industry or just found a peaceful place to get away from it all once or twice a week. A good gaming store promotes this and encourages it. We often grumble about that guy at the game store. But sometimes that's the only place that person feels welcome. And we're the only friends he has. Meetups outside game stores are great, but they often can feel clickish in themselves. And, you know, you don't know what you're getting into, but a game store can often feel very welcoming. Also, hands-on. A, gr a great gaming store provides you with the opportunity to play a game hands-on. I don't know... Uh, I don't feel like a Kirk clerk needs to know everything about the game store, but just what a joy it is when they can show you and let you touch the game right then and there. Tactical, or tactile, I'm sorry, and visual stimuli are a big part of gaming. And while I can look at videos and pieces on the internet until the cows come home, actually feeling the heft of a game, gasping and all at the miniatures of it inside it, flicking a card across the table is something you can do at a store. Many great gaming stores, their clerks are basically game sommelier where people can answer your questions. Sometimes... In the mail, uh, email, I'll get it. Well, not sometimes. I get them all the time. I get emails from people saying, I like this game, this game, this game, this game. What should I get? I really don't have time to answer all those questions. But that clerk at the game store, he's willing. That's his job. He's, they're, they're willing to help you do that. It's uh, just a great place. And then you can pick the game up and feel it and look at it for yourself. And there's tournaments. I'm not the biggest guy who wants to play in tournaments. I like my gaming casual, but I, I realize that I'm kind of a minority there. Many people like to play on a competitive level, whether there's prizes involved or not. And so many publishers nowadays are offering tournament kits for the organized play of games, some with pretty cool prizes. And this doesn't really work outside of the store. They're on the forefront of this happening. You have the opportunity to get upgrades to games, but also to play against others who love the game as much as you do. The store becomes a focal point for like-minded gamers to meet up and play with each other. And obviously Magic the Gathering has this down to a science, but the other games also have fan groups and the store is the best place for them to meet up and play. Now this next one, new experiences, is the one thing local game stores do that I don't know you can get anywhere else. When I invite people to my house, I'm likely to invite people who at minimum like the same type of games I do. I'm probably also likely to invite people who have at least the same world views, or agree with me at least on some various topics, latest movies, or just the kind of games we like, right? But going to a game store forces you to interact with people you might not normally hang out with. It might cause you to play a game that's outside your comfort zone, and you might discover a new game or even play or a new genre that's fascinating, or at least it will expand your world view. There's a lot of the games I would never give the second glance to, but while I'm at a game store, I see someone else playing them, I go, oh, that looks really interesting. And I wouldn't have done that otherwise. And it's, it's even greater when it comes to people, though. You have the opportunity to learn how to get along with people who you disagree with everything else on. Remember when I said it's that place where everyone knows your name, it's that third place? All that other stuff is put to the side, and you can just sit there and play games, and you'll make new friends. You'll discover the joy of interacting with new people for the first time. That's not the easiest thing to do. Some people, it's really hard. But going to the local game store allows you to meet a colorful cast of characters, of which you are one, and I am one to be bonded by the one thing everyone enjoys, gaming. Then finally, new models. I really can't say enough good things about board game cafes. They're, in my opinion, one of the main, this is the, the, one of the future th arms of game stores in the industry. Snakes and Lattes in Canada is probably the shining example, but every game cafe that I've ever been to has been nothing short than amazing. Mixing foods or other things like a game tavern uh, seems to be a you know, really a surefire way of promoting fun and unity amongst gamers and people. And while Miami, I've said that Miami doesn't have a great game store, Miami does have a great board game cafe. Check out Mac and Chess. Their food is 
really good. And you mix that with gaming. And every time I walk into a board game cafe, it's like bustling. The atmosphere just lifts my spirits. The friendliness, which is a must at any great game, local game store, seems to shine in these settings. And while every cafe I've been to feels unique in its own way, they all really seem to shine. And each of them does exactly what I think is important for the small retailer. They make me want to go back. When I go to a town where I know a game cafe exists, I will do my best to go there because it's a magical place for me. And these are not the only future models. We're seeing other things. We're seeing game stores do all sorts of interesting things to move and mold as the times change. And that, just when you go into these places, like I said, it just is this magical moment. Magic. It's, when I was a kid, going to the toy store just gave you a magical feeling. To see piles of games and toys on the shelves, that's a fantastic thing. Board game stores can give that same magical feeling to walk in and see not only stacks of marvelous games, but people who love them as much, if not more, than you do. I said at the beginning I haven't been to a ton of amazing local game stores, although I know many of them exist. I would like to change my knowledge on the subject. I've heard from a lot of people this week about their game store. I like to publicize these game stores. If you own a store, if you're involved in a store, just a store you love, send me a video. Really, just send me a video. Talk to me. I mean, if you're working with a store, you can get their permission, obviously. But send me a video of the store, and if it's long enough, I'll post it as a separate video on the Dice Tower. Otherwise, I can just put it, you know, as a segment here in Board Game Breakfast. But I would like to show great gaming games to the world. I don't want to have this excuse, well, I don't know all these game stores. I won't be able to say that, right? These are great gaming stores that exist. This way we can all help each other and we can promote the stores that do deserve our support, do provide a fun, safe, amazing experience for people to game and make friends in. I'm obviously a fan of the internet. I mean, it's how I make my living. It's how I learned. It's how I found out about these great games. It's, I met some wonderful people who have become lifelong friends. And it's an amazing tool, but it cannot and will not, at least for me, replace real life interactions. I know some people have sworn off conventions and going to local game stores, not me. I like to meet people face to face and that's why I've gone to game stores I haven't been a big fan of because I just want that interaction. But that interaction mixed with an amazing store can be one of the best experiences of your life. I love that more of these and I'm sure my listeners would too. So share with me the great stores that you know or are a part of and we'll shout it from the rooftops here. I want to make the Dice Tower of force for positive change. And so we will gladly do that. Next week, I'm going to continue this series. It's been somewhat of a shift here. And I want to talk about what is the gamer's responsibility to their local store? What can you do to make your local store better? How can you help them? Once again, I know that my statements last week could easily be taken as a wide, scathing indictment of the entire local retail community. And some people maybe have used me as an excuse to maybe stop shopping at their local game store. Well, if that's the case, I denounce that and I say shame on me for even making that a possibility. I hate that. I'm not here to be a leader of a movement of anger. I want to be part of positive change in the industry. I really, and this is, I really want to see great stores do well, all right? I, I slam bad game stores, and I, and, I, and I don't even feel bad about that, okay? Because I don't think a bad business deserves support. But when I bring down the good ones with it, that's problematic, and I do not mean that. I, I want to see them flourish and, and grow, and I hope that as online media creators can join forces with the people who are essentially on the front lines of gaming at the local game store and make gaming a more inclusive, welcoming, amazing community for everyone. You're always welcome to challenge me on my thoughts. This is not an isolation thing. I like to say what I think here. My email is tomvassal at gmail.com. Please let me know what you think. I would love to share that I'm always looking for diverse opinions from all over the place having board game breakfast. Not everyone needs to agree with me. I just want to promote board gaming as a whole. Not sure my segment last week did that. I hope my segment this week is better, and I will try to do better as we go forward in the future. That being said, let's get to the rest of the show. The news is here. 
At this point, let's talk about some interesting things that I've seen. First of all, we'll take a look here. Renegade and Oni Press are coming out with the Dragon, or the T Dragon Society. This is based on a web comic. I mean, I really like the artwork of this, so I'm gonna probably have to go check out this web comic. Uh, this is from Steve Ellis and Tyler Tinsley. So this one is coming out, I believe, next year. WizKids has announced a couple of games. First, there's Darknet. This is not about the dark web. I think it's just about a future with hackers. I, you know, kind of the same theme as Android Netrunner. And Kung Fu Zoo. Now, this game actually has me excited because I played Kung Fu Zoo at Origins in 2015. A game where you're just trying to knock dice in the holes. I, I just like that. I like the idea of it capturing animals. So I hope that they keep that fun in the game. The German game prizes, the DSP or Deutsche Spieler Press uh, um, awards have been announced, or the award has been announced for Terraforming Mars. They give this, this award is given out at the Essen Fair in a couple weeks. Um, and there's a whole lot of games. These games, this award usually tends to skew higher than the uh, the, the Spiel des Jahres, which is more of a family weight game. This is a game that's voted on by gamers. Passport has announced Entropy Worlds Collide. It's a two to six player card game based on Entropy. Um, so this one, I think, has a, a new theming on it. So that's coming out soon. I like the artwork of this one. Now, this one's interesting to me. Um, Mr. B Games is releasing Biogenesis, Biogenesis and Bios Megafauna. Um, these are second editions. These are coming out in November. I don't know if they're going to be at Essen or not. But these were designed by Phil Eklund from Sierra Madre Games. Now, Phil puts heavy, hard science into his games. His games are very involved. There's a lot going on in them. And so that's the case with these. I mean, I've never touched his games because they're just way too complex for me. But some people really do like them. And so I guess a lot of people are going to really enjoy it about enjoy to see Mr. B bringing them out. CGE has announced Pulsar 2849. It's a dice drafting game, which is coming out in two weeks at Essen. Simon has announced Jules Voltaire um, as their new Chief Operating Officer, COO. Um, Jules actually used to be one, one of the advertising heads or promotional heads at Asmodee. This was back before Asmodee and Fantasy Flight merged. Um, so now Simon has him, and I'm, he's just a really great guy. Ticket to Ride First Journey is coming from Days of Wonder to the digital space, so I'm sure a lot of people will now let their kids play that on their iPads. And there's a new um, board game uh, sleeve company called Board Game Sleeves. Uh, this is a market that's not as crowded as you might think. There's the Mayfair, um, May Day, I'm sorry, May Day uh, does the sleeves, and then Ultra Pro does sleeves, and a few other people do sleeves, but there's a lot of companies that do sleeves, but not so many companies that do sleeves for different Euro-style games. So we'll have to wait and see where this heads out. All right, that's the news in a weird place. Let's keep going on with the rest of the show. Happy breakfast, everybody. Today we get to see some beautiful sunsets, a tiny dark war, and even some fantasy bluffing in today's crowdfunding roundup. Let's get going. Gamelin Games is back with an expansion to Tiny Epic Defenders with The Dark War. The Dark War features a ton of new elements, including new challenging corrupted regions, caravans to rescue, new heroes and artifacts, and other mechanisms. Plus, there's a multi-game campaign mode that has you facing off against a new enemy type. The box is chock full of high-quality components, including item meeples and wooden bits. On top of this, Gamelin has refreshed Tiny Epic Defenders, the base game, with a second edition available in this campaign. The art has been fully updated, some of the gameplay has been updated too, and it has item meeples. There are a number of pledge levels due to the variety of options, including a deluxe edition that includes more of those awesome items for your item meeples. If you want the updated second edition of Tiny Epic Defenders, that takes a pledge of $25. But to get the full Tiny Epic Deluxe package, including the Dark War, that takes a pledge of $46 plus shipping. But there's a discount level if you already own the first edition of the game. Guardian's Call is the new beautifully illustrated game from Druid City Games. Thematically, players are heroes of the realm vying to become the leader of the Guardians. Through bluffing and set collection, players work to collect items like weapons and artifacts in order to gain the king's favor. Villagers advance on your castle track, spells can serve as wilds, and artifacts can earn you one-time use abilities, and so on. 
Players offer sets of cards to each other, but may lie about what's in the offer. If the opponent guesses the truth, they keep the cards. If they guess wrong, you get to keep the cards. And there are curse cards that up the ante. Each character has a card type affinity for some asymmetry, and Guardian's Call features lovely and inclusive art. You can get a copy of Guardian's Call for a pledge of $39. Ghostal Weird Guests and More Ghosts is an expansion to last year's Ghostal. Ghostal is a well-received dice worker placement game in which players are ghosts trying to scare away guests from their house. The new Trick or Treaters expansion includes kids who you can scare away, get candy from, and keep them as guests who you can pay with candy to help you scare away other guests using their costume-based ability. You can also use candy to steal Trick or Treaters from other ghosts. Family Values adds a group of guests, but in a family. They have a room, but different colors, adding a set collection element to the game because collecting a family earns you bonus points. And you can increase the player count of the game up to six with this campaign through the optional add-ons that include all the pieces you need for an additional player. And you can even pick the new colors. You can get the Trick or Treaters and Family Values expansion for Ghostal for a pledge of £20 plus shipping. Ruby Combat Ready is a card battling game based on the popular anime Ruby. Published by Arcane Wonders, Ruby is a fast-paced cooperative game designed to capture the essence of the show, focusing on battle and teamwork. Players take on the role of one of the series' heroes, each of whom has a unique deck of cards representing their attacks, actions, and moves. Each takes a turn being the center stage fighter, while other players support them or deal with other objectives. The game takes place against different scenarios available in a scenario book, each of which has different villains, rules, and win conditions. You'll gauge your moves carefully to build up Battle Fury and can use the back of the villain cards to give you a hint of what you should prepare for. The game has been upgraded through stretch goals to include minis for the characters, and you can get a copy of Ruby Combat Ready for a pledge of $45. Last but not least, Sunset Over Water has you on an artistic journey. Designed by the king of the fillers, Steve Finn, in Sunset Over Water, you'll be hiking around and seeking out special locations to paint. In each of the six rounds, you'll play a goal card that determines the time you wake up, the direction and distance you'll travel, and the number of paintings that you can complete. You can trade the paintings in for commissions or the daily goal, or you can save them for endgame scoring. On top of that, there's a solo variant from the designer of Role Player. And, of course, the art by Beth Sobel is the heart of the game. The cards depict lush, colorful landscapes, making this game an absolute treat for the eyes. The theme and gameplay make Sunset Over Water a great gateway game, and you can get a copy for just $19 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, and as of the time of this recording, this year's long board game convention season is starting to finally enter its final lurch towards the end of the year. Now, most of these events focus on sales, retail relationships, and playing as many board games as possible until finally collapsing in fatigue while trying to read newly acquired rule books during your flight home. But what about board gaming events for those with more intellectual pursuits, that side of the hobby? Well, if that's your bag, then you may want to check out the Board Game Studies Colloquium. As per their website, the annual Board Game Studies Colloquium is the only recurring annual event devoted solely to the academic study of non-digital games. Its existence was a fascinating discovery for me this week, because it seems to approach the hobby from the complete opposite end of the spectrum as the better-known conventions, such as the retail carnival that is Gen Con. But what do I mean by the quote-unquote intellectual side of board games? Well, here are some examples. Uh, this year's colloquium included seminars on enigmatic board games in early Catholic contexts, the symbolic meanings of the Merrill's board, and board games in pre-Islamic Indonesia, finds of gaming implements from shipwreck sites considered against old Javanese and classical melee textual evidence. 
And if the Board Game Studies Colloquium's curriculum isn't enough to make a board game enthusiast feel dangerously unqualified, their roster of attendees will. The Board Game Studies Colloquium's participants include a large number of people from a wide range of disciplines, including archaeology, anthropology, psychology, mathematics, history, philosophy, no, not philosophy, philology, which I don't even know what that is, and computer science. Uh, by comparison, at Gen Con, I spend my time with a man who enjoys wearing a variety of hats and a guy with a penchant for rodents and circular chocolatey snacks. I mean, sure, no, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't trade the time I get to spend with these people for the world! But we're also not debating a conceptual metaphor analysis of a Swedish dice game book from the 17th century. But we do play dice in a bowl, which still counts as the same thing if, if, if you swear in Danish when you lose. I want to know if anyone watching this has ever actually attended it. And if you have, let me know in the comments below what it was like. You know, I'd be interested in knowing if it's worth finding a way myself to sneak my way into it. I mean, if for no other reason than to be able to impress my friends with metaphorical 17th century Swedish dice trivia at the next Gen Con. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Man, we finally are getting to do it. We're finally going to go on our Dude, world travel trip, you this know? This is amazing. We're going to use an actual old school map like old people. Dude, let's plan out our trip. Like, where should we start? Okay, okay. Yeah, this map's a little older, but like, I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I've been hearing really good things about is Zaire. Dude, Central Africa is really cool this time of year. Yeah. And then oh, then we can go to Yemen and we can go to the democratic Yemen as well. That's right. And then let's go to Europe. Let's, let's, let's pop up. Let's go see, you know, let's go see Dave and stuff. Let's go through Yugoslavia first, though. Then we can go into Czechoslovakia. Yeah, dude. Let's go get into some new CGE games. Yeah. Let's go. We, we can't find Prodigal's Club anywhere. We might as well go to their headquarters. Go to Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, exactly. Right. Is Dave in West Germany or East Germany? I think he's in East Germany. Is he in East Germany? Yeah, okay. Let's go to East Germany. But let's hit West Germany first, real quick. Yeah, it's on the way. You know, just, sure. just okay. for some brat. And then what about, like, there's this whole humongous pink blob? USSR. Usser. Maybe that's like a yeah, Usher. Eastern Is European. that where Usher's uh, from? Let's go visit I can't Usher's wait not to have phones, man. It's going to be so cool. We're going to old school. But. We're not gonna be able to like tweet anything if we don't have our phones. No, let's just let's just use our phones right now. Alright, let's just do that. Okay, that'd be best. Alright, so this is National Geographic Global Pursuit. Globe trotting. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So this is a tile placement slash geography slash trivia game. You're making up the earth. Really just kind of make an insanely multi-earth earth. earth. So you're going to place a tile and then you have to answer a trivia question based on whatever tile you place. There are four different kinds of tiles. There are historical happenings, people and places, planet earth, and people and products. And they all look different. Once you place a tile, whatever category that tile is in, you answer a trivia question from there and then you get points if you get it correctly. Once you run out of all the different tiles, whoever has the most points wins. So that was National Geographic Global Pursuit. Even though no one's like chasing each other in it. This game actually was pretty darn fun for like a trivia geography type game. This one is nice because you have the tile placement too. Yeah. And it like, it's funny because when we were first playing, I was like, oh, one of the benefits of this is it like lets kids learn geography. I mean like, oh, Australia yeah. is next to Indonesia. Works. But then it doesn't because it has this weird way that it fits together where you can start building multiple Earths. So that's going to be it for us, you guys. Check out This Game is Broken. We have our third episode of our mega super hit dropping in two days. Until next time, we'll see you in Zaire. We'll see you in the Democratic Yemen. Hey, yeah, you're welcome to Tantrum House HQ. I'm Will Meadows. And I'm Ryan Pills. And today on The Throwdown, we've got Shadowrun Crossfire in the red corner and Thunderstone in the blue corner. Thunderstone from AEG is a cooperative deck building card game from designer Mike Elliott. It's a one to five player game in which players attempt to collect Thunderstones by building up their hand of heroes. In the dungeon, they will find vile monsters, and if they are strong enough to defeat them, they will claim victory points. Eventually, the Thunderstone will be revealed, and once a player has taken it, it will mark the end of the game, and the player with the most victory points will win. Shatter and Crossfire is a cooperative deck builder for up to four players from Catalyst Game Labs. In it, Players attempt to eliminate obstacles and complete mission objectives. At the end of each successful mission, players earn karma that they can then use to gain new abilities for their characters to take into the next mission. All right, so we're looking at two different deck building games that employ some of the same mechanics and are for similar player counts. We're going to do the throwdown and give you guys our vote. So are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one. Throwdown. I knew you would pick that game. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I do like this one more, I think. Yeah. Uh, they both have Mike Elliott as designer, so He's it's a hard choice. Sure. Yep. I own both of these games. They're both uh, But this game, I've gotten a lot more use out of, and they're coming out with a new version. I heard this at Gen Con. There's going to be... Expansion um, or version? Or what's yeah, that? there's going to be a new expansion, which throws in a uh, new mission type. How I don't know how you set it up, but it's got like tiles for setting up, so that looks interesting. And they're also revising some of the rules for like a Prime Runner edition or something like cool, that. Cool, cool. I like it's the theme cool. on that one, and I like the art, but I just like the way this one plays better. I think I like the standard, you know, like deck builder one time experience. I'm not the campaign. Yeah, I like how there's more objective in this one than uh, in Dominion. I think yeah. it's definitely a step up. From yeah, that. cool stuff. All right, thanks for joining us. See you guys next time. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, uh, we're going to continue our top 100 games of all time, but you're only going to see one of those this week instead of two. Now, before you go, what? That's because we're posting a regular top 10 list this week, and that's our top 10 anticipated games from Eschen Spiel, which is coming up. But that's not the only thing you'll see from Eschen Spiel. You'll probably see some other videos regarding Essen and different games we're looking forward to. We wanted to give people some time before the fair. I'm sure if you're going to it or even if you're just watching it online, you want to kind of have your list together and things. There's a 800 plus games that are being released at this fair, so that's just a huge amount. It's a lot of work to go through. I, I promise you that. So that's coming up. Also, just more, 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 more reviews. We got a lot of different reviews coming out this week. We got some pretty big name reviews coming out next week but there's still some pretty good stuff coming out this week so check that out also the dice tower we post that every uh week uh eric and i and uh russ lakeland from d6 generation will be talking about one versus many games that's going to be posted this tuesday and um well that's all i can think about so let's get going to the rest of the show is there a board game setting that you'd like to play an rpg in hi i'm chris renshaw from the boards and swords podcast and welcome to role playing. Legend of the Five Rings is a property that Fantasy Flight Games bought up from AEG a few years ago. It was both a CCG and a pretty well loved RPG. Well, last week, Fantasy Flight Games released the first L5R product, the core set for the Legend of the Five Rings LCG. But in addition to that, they also released the open beta rule set so you can anybody can look at this for the Legend of the Five Rings RPG. Now in case you're not familiar with it, L5R as it's known is a setting it takes place in the world of Rokugan where seven clans of samurai battle for power and glory and honor. Really detailed environment that's got a lot of setting, it's got a lot of lore years and years of history that have gone into this game and even games such as the CCG helped to drive some of that lore. If you've played the core set and it sounded really cool and it sounds like a really awesome world to you, I would highly recommend going on to their website and checking out the open beta rules for the L5R RPG. Now I will warn you it's not a beginner friendly RPG at all. It can be a little bit complex and the previous versions of the game were definitely seen as more of an expert level RPG. Fantasy Flight may have seen it kind of pull back a little bit, but it's definitely not somebody that's never played RPGs is gonna be wanting to check it out. Is there a board game setting that you'd like to see turned into an RPG? Let me know down in the comments below. And make sure you follow me on various social media and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Obsessive Comics Disorder. And in the meantime, until I see you next time, may all your hits be crits. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of King Domino. So King Domino is an interesting tile placement game, but the mechanism that I really enjoy is tile drafting and how that leads to turn order. So let me show you a little bit about that and why I really like it. So the setup for King Domino is fairly simple because you only open the box and every player will take their own little castle and starting tile marker and then they will each get one of these cute little meeples. You'll then grab the first four tiles in the box and place them in ascending order. After you arrange them, you simply place them down and then every player will place one of their meeples on it as well, determining who is going first, second, 
third, and fourth. And then you'll grab the next four tiles and you'll arrange them again in ascending order. You'll place them right next to the other previous tiles. The first player which is on top will decide which one of the next four tiles they want next. That will also determine turn order for the next round. So this player will be last next round. They'll grab this one tile that they just left and place it in their kingdom following placement rules. Once all the tiles are spoken for, then you just repeat the process by drawing another four and placing them here in ascending order. The object of the game is to make a five by five grid and then you'll score by counting the number of crowns each region and then multiplying that by the number of tiles of that type. So as you can see, King Domino is fairly easy to understand and to teach. In fact, I even taught my grandma. But the cool thing is that a gamer like myself can also maintain interest. This game offers an interesting take on tile drafting because it will determine turn order. And because of that extra little layer, there's a little bit more thought than just simple tile placement in the game. All right, well, thanks for joining us and I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Good smell. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime. lunchtime! So today we're looking at Samurai Gardener. It is a game designed by Hisashi Hayashi, published by Osprey Games, plays two to five players ages 10 and up in about 15 to 20 minutes. In Samurai Gardener, each player is developing their garden, building out their garden by playing cards out that have different features. And there's four different feature types. There's garden, path, tatami, and pond. When you uh, line up a row or a column of three of the same feature type, then you can choose to score it and get earned points. First player to 25 points triggers endgame and high score wins. Mm -hmm. so, uh, did you like this one? I did. It's very calm. It's kind of got that zen feel. I like it. Although at first you got the seizing, which is fast, but yeah. then the... The making your garden is calm. <laughs> so that's the part I wasn't crazy about. I didn't really like the whole seizing part, but then again, anything that involves any type of dexterity for the most part, not a huge fan of, and I have nails. So, you know, I ended up scratching a few people just to get some cards. Shouldn't be painful to play a game. <laughs> yeah, d don't injure your, your fellow players. <laughs> but the game itself, I enjoyed. Like, it was very reminiscent of Honshu, mm -hmm. which we've talked yeah. about before. Um, slightly different, like the scoring is definitely different. You don't have those resource cubes. Um, but I like the fact that you could do score, uh, getting multiple uh, rows mm -hmm. gave you lots of points, mm -hmm. especially if you did them one turn. Exactly. And the strategy, of course, is you cannot score a, a type until it gets turned over. The only way to do that is to score all four types. So you got to find a way to score all four so you can get the other ones back up so you can score them again. Got to have a good variety of things in your garden. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So for me, I would definitely play it again, but I am I'm a little concerned about the seizing bit of it, but the game itself was good and we had fun. Oh yes. I definitely enjoy what my garden looks like, although some people were so stressed about it doesn't look good. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> and the bruises will heal. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Maybe not the scratches. But <laughs> So safe to say, I think we'll be playing this one again. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And that's it for now. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Hello, nerdy inventions is the game we are talking about in the best and the worst with Niels from Soul of Batchfield. And I would say no wasting time anymore. Just jump into it. What I really like on Nerdy Inventions is when you roll three dice and you always roll three dice, you take whatever you have, but you can use and manipulate the dice. Whatever you want slash need, you can try to work on that. I have a couple of inventions that allows me to do some stuff. For an example, with this one, I can split one of these dice into two. So I could take, for an example, a four and make a one and a three out of it. Now I have this invention that allows me to reduce a die down to a three and now I can take these two here and pay it here. However, and this is what is the flip side of the game, usually whatever you are rolling when you not have the split dice, you are limited to three dice, determines really what can I afford. So you really try to figure out what can I do. This cost, for an example, 15. That is never in my range. This costs three 
twos never in my range. This cost a three and a three. Maybe I can reach this. This cost me a two and a four. So you see, most of these are eliminated once you did that. The only exception is a six. That's a wild one. So a joker. So really, you are only limited down to one or two options. And that doesn't feel really good because you roll the dice and take whatever you get out of it. You manipulate only the dice to really get at least one thing out of it. So it feels neat to manipulate the dice or even the position of the cards here. But at the end of the day, you have the choice of getting one card or getting no card. And you pick always the one card, obviously. And that was Nordy Inventions, Niels Cyril's Brettspiel. That was my favorite part on it. Yeah, and the thing I don't like too much on it. See you next week here on the Board Game Breakfast. Bye bye. Hi everyone. The northeast of Spain is beautiful. Catalonia has everything. Great beaches, nice cities, and they were the first part of the country to break with certain traditions. Well, last week they broke with some more traditions. They called out an independence referendum. But in Spain's constitution it is written that Spain must stay united. So the general government of Spain ruled the vote for independence illegal. And they even sent troops to Catalonia to prevent polling stations from opening. But the people from Catalonia, they really wanted to vote. So they organized sleepovers in the polling stations, families with kids, playing games, making sure that everyone could vote on Sunday. The national police tried to intervene and even was brutal, but the vote took place with over 90% of the people voting for independence, which probably will be declared sometime this week. This week, I am playing a game that once was won, but tries to break itself free and become independent. This week, I am playing Century Spies Road. Golem Edition. Century Spies Road is an easy game. On your turn you can do four things. You can buy a card, play a card, pick up all the cards that you played in previous rounds back into your hand, or use your spices to gain cards with points on them. The cards all have actions on them, like gain more spices or trade spices you already have for different ones. It's easy, it's fun, and when the game starts flowing and you've got a little engine going, it's very fulfilling. The designer, Emerson Matsuchi, made a different version of the game, the Golem Edition. Same game, but it had different art, and instead of spices, you were dealing with gems. But the original version will have expansions, and the Golem Edition will not be compatible with those expansions. So I call for a vote. Give Century Golem Edition its independence. Its own expansions let the game evolve in a different direction, away from Spice Road. Don't let game publishers decide that cubes and spices are better than gems and golems. No, together we can change the world. Put the word golem in the comments so I know that you are with me. And together we can save the golem. Save the golem. Save the golem. Hi, Mike Lisio from Solo Mode Games. Recently, while browsing through my subscription feed on Board Game Geek, I came across a thread for the game Sentient. This is one of my favorite games from this year. I got it at Origins and I've really enjoyed playing it. The thread was regarding whether there was any possibility for a solo variant for the game. And while some people responded and thought that there was not likely to have one or coming up with particular ideas, the designer, J. Alex Kevern, came on and proposed a beat your high score variant that looked pretty promising and uh, got some responses to that. I thought it was a great idea. I was really encouraged by the, by the notion of it, but I was wondering if there was a way to make an AI opponent for this variant because when it, I'm playing a solo game, I tend to like to have a definite win-loss condition rather than a beat your high score variant. And so I had an idea of how that might work and kind of proposed it and went ahead and filmed a video with a playthrough of the designer's variant with that little tweak that I added to give it an AI opponent. And so I was wondering if you're interested in playing this game solo and you wanted to give this a shot, this variant a shot, maybe either or both of those variants, 
Maybe you could be part of some playtesting and we can get an idea if this really is a viable variant for the game uh, to have a solo mode for it. Uh, if you are interested, you can hop on to Board Game Geek. I'll go ahead and post a link here and uh, you can see if it's something you might be interested in. It's very quick, so it shouldn't take you very long. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear what you come up with and see if there's uh, any changes that can be made, adjustments, modifications, etc. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. On this episode, we have someone that's looking for a game that's like Netrunner, but is not like Netrunner. So, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and this is What Should I Get, where we go on the board game subreddit and check out the daily personalized game recommendation, and go ahead and recommend games for people. So, let's go ahead and start. Evil Master is looking for a game like Netrunner with asymmetrical powers, and also the intense bluffing mechanics like how they do with the runs, except they're kind of sick of the deck building and also the LCG lifestyle, so they're looking for other games to check out. So on the lighter and quicker side, definitely we'll go with 13 Days Cuban Missile Crisis, BattleCon, and also Mr. Jack, the 10th Anniversary Edition. And if you're looking for games with a bit more in-depth, I'd check out Star Wars Rebellion, Tragedy Looper, and just about any other one versus all game out there. And sorry to make that segment a little bit quick this week, but we're going to be introducing something new this week, and that's going to be the Question of the Week. Question of the Week is basically a question that went unanswered on the board game subreddit, and we're going to leave it up to you guys, the viewers, to go ahead and answer that one. So, let's see what this question is. So this week's question is, Noah Smitty is looking for a game that the strategy heavily relies on a start setup, or kind of like how the first couple turns roll out, sort of how it is in Lost Legacy. So he's looking for games that are similar to that. So if you think you know the answer to that question, be sure to answer in the comments down below. And that was another episode of What Should I Get? Be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendation. And people like me and a whole bunch of other people go ahead and answer those questions for you. And I'm Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying your breakfast. My name's Dan, and um, well, I don't have Cora with me today because I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. Um, I'd actually want to talk about my oldest daughter, Amy, who's um, who's 14 years old. Um, I've got three kids. I've got Cora, who's um, five. I've got Evan, who's 10, and uh, Amy, who's 40. Well, 13, but very nearly 14. Um, now, Cora and Evan love games. They'll play games all day long, but Amy doesn't like games. In fact, she'd probably describe herself as, as disliking them strongly. Um, she doesn't want to play them, she doesn't want to play them with me, and she doesn't want to play them with her sister or brother. Uh, her friends come round and they see all the games behind us here. They want to play the games and she's she doesn't want to play them. Um, and that's absolutely fine, you know, our kids don't need to like the same things we do. In fact, the very definition of a teenager is probably not liking the same things her parents like. But I think there are things that happened in, in Amy's childhood um, that I'm responsible for that has turned her off gaming. And I wanted to share that with you because I think it might be useful to some people. I'm, I'm the last person in the world to give parenting tips. I'm no expert. I don't know what I'm doing half the time. And the other half the time I'm doing it wrong. But I did learn some things from the mistakes I made with, um, with Amy. And um, I thought I'd share my experiences with you. About five years ago, I started getting really quite heavily into gaming. I've been around the edges previously, but this was when I started really immersing myself. And I wanted to take my family with me, uh, particularly the kids. I wanted to play games with the kids. Um, and so I started playing games with, with Amy, really. Um, and sh she really enjoyed it initially. She, she, she was into it. She liked spending time with me. She liked playing the games. We had a good time, we had a good laugh. And then things started going wrong. And the things that went wrong weren't, weren't her fault. They were, they were my fault. And I've kind of broken them down into kind of three categories. So next week, I'm going to talk about what it was that I might have done Put Amy off board gaming. See you then. Oh! Greetings citizens of the neural net. I didn't see you there. If you're anything like me, you are probably less than satisfied with the service provided by the Galactic Postal Office. Their service bots are cantankerous, the shipments are slow, and you've got to follow all these stupid rules about what you can and cannot mail to all your buddies out in Alpha Centauri. Easy, Chewy. Then 
nice people at Osprey Games sent us this little package via Space Courier, and we were thrilled to find out that it contained Star Cartel. Now, product this hot is currently only available at our Snakes and Lattes Annex location, but we hope to make a big score real soon that's going to allow us to bring this to every Snakes and Lattes venue in the known universe. And maybe, just maybe, have enough left over that we can afford to retire to that private asteroid in the Horsehead Nebula. In Star Cartel, players are smugglers trying to ship contraband goods such as weapons, energy crystals, exotic plants, and more. If you're a smart smuggler, you get to skim a little off each delivery for yourself to put into your cosmic nest egg. Your choice of how much you deliver of the different goods will allow you to manipulate the galactic market, moving the value of desired cargo up and unpopular junk down. But be careful, because if you flood the market with too much of a good thing, its value tanks, and you could be left with a bunch of worthless goo No matter what you're shipping, every time you make a delivery, the Star Cartel pays you enough that you can upgrade your ship to something bigger, better, and maybe even something with special abilities. Star Cartel quickly became a staff favorite here at Snakes because it's good for three to six smugglers, is easy to teach, and takes only about 30 minutes to play. Because we got something in the mail, now it's time for one of our lucky Twitter followers to get something in the mail. You know the rules. Follow at Snakes and Lattes on Twitter. Send us a tweet, this time using the very important hashtag, hashtag Snakes and Lattes. I use these compartments for smuggling. And on the star date that is appearing on your screen right here, we will pick one random tweet that uses that hashtag, and they'll receive their very own copy of Osprey Games' Star Cartel. And that's it for this week, folks. Thanks so much for coming on board another Board Game Breakfast. Um, great news. Dice Tower Cruise has sold out. I guess that's not great news if you wanted to come on Dice Tower. If you want to come on the Dice Tower Cruise, and we're, we are sold out, but you can email DiceTowerCruise at gmail.com and get put on a waiting list, and we'll see what we can do about getting you in. But at this point, we're making full preparations to go full bear. Also, a couple of other little snippets for Dice Tower. Um, I didn't do a Q&A last week, although I kind of did because me and Eric, the Dice Tower Tonight, which is every other Wednesday, on weeks that I do Dice Tower Tonight with Eric, I may not do a normal Q&A that week. And Sam did one last week too. So um, I'll try to get one done this week. So I'm not sure when it's going to happen. We are playing some legacy games and those are taking up a good chunk of our time as we're trying to get in as much of that as possible so we can review them properly. But I'll try to get one of those out to you this week. And also we're preparing and getting stuff done for Essen. And then right after that, PAX Unplugged. We're going to have a booth at PAX Unplugged. We're going to be with the Geek and Sun folks at their booth. So you'll be able to find us there. Uh, PAX Unplugged is a little thing uh, called Penny Arcade where you have little pins. So we'll have those at our booth. And if you want to get those, um, we'll, those will be available there. Um, PAX Unplugged, I was initially going to do some sort of outing the day before uh, PAX Unplugged where we went to the Shady Maple Complex in Pennsylvania because I love it so much. But I've uh, kind of... I, I pulled the plug on that mostly because we're really behind here at the Dice Tower. The hurricane has really thrown us behind. Um, and just, uh, this is our first time with PAX, so we want to kind of see the lay of the land. And I figured if we did do anything on the Thursday beforehand, we can go see some historical stuff and fun things in Philadelphia itself. So if you're around there the day before or whatever, we might be there. We'll probably set up our booth a bit, but we'll also be hanging around. We hope to see many of you there. All right. I think that's everything now. Folks, as always, I'm so pleased that you spent that you chose to spend some of your time watching this show. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this has been Board Game Breakfast. Bye.